Okay. So I want to uh, warmly welcome you uh, to the first webinar of the Immunization Monitoring Academy, which is uh, part of the WHO Scholar Program. Um, we are here in Geneva, Switzerland today. I'm here with uh, Laura Craw and Jan Gravendonk. Um, before we kick off, we wanted to get a sense of where you are connecting from. You can tell us in the chat, of course, and there are 232 um, attendees uh, who have uh, joined already. Uh, we have over 870 um, participants who registered for this webinar. And so I invite you to go to the website menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com. You can use your phone if you're working on your desktop computer and then type the code 300536. You will see a box into which you can type your, uh, the name of the country that you are connecting from. So we see, uh, and of course, the bigger the letters, the more people are connecting from this country. So we can see Nigeria, Ghana, India, Pakistan, Kenya, Cameroon, uh, many different countries. It's a pleasure to see. So let's, um, uh, let's give you another minute or so to um, type in your country. If you want to see your country represented, do not wait any longer. Uh, go to the website menti, M-E-N-T-I.com and use the code 300536. We'll give you a minute or more so to, uh, uh, to do so. So today we're going to be presenting on um, data improvement plans, uh, getting into deep diving into the topic. We have 60 minutes scheduled, but we will go, we, we will take questions up through 12.30 Geneva time, so through to 90 minutes. So at minimum, if you had scheduled 60 minutes, you may miss some of the answers to questions, but you'll definitely get the full content. And if you can stay 90 minutes, you will get the full benefit of this uh, webinar. And I see that there are, um, so there is a question from Rizwana who says uh, no voice. So this may be a bandwidth issue. I'm not getting any other reports of anyone who is not able to hear me. And a question, um, and I see there's a question already that we'll be, we'll be dealing with after the presentation and that sort of strategic moments during the presentation where it makes sense to take, uh, uh, to take questions. So we're now 272 uh, attendees. All right, so we can see the countries. If you have not responded yet, this will be the last chance uh, to uh, respond. And I think in about a minute or so, then we'll get started with the next uh, next, uh, next slide. So we're using the website menti.com. So as you listen to the webinar, and um, I encourage you to go to the website menti.com. That is where you will be able to see the slide presentation and even more important, uh, respond to specific questions, give us your inputs and contribute. In addition, within the um, Zoom interface, you'll see you have a chat and I see most of you have already found the, uh, the chat, but uh, there is also a Q&A panel and that is where you can ask your questions. So if you have questions about data improvement plans, I would ask you maybe to wait until we're through with the presentation. So you, 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 you probably have answers to many questions during the presentations, but as soon as, um, as you get a feel for <clears throat> what we are discussing and want to formulate specific questions, please use the Q&A panel to, uh, uh, to do this. And I see there are already some uh, good questions uh, coming in. All right, uh, so obviously uh, many participants from Nigeria, India, Pakistan, Ghana, Cameroon, uh, Kenya, Indonesia, Bahrain, uh, Myanmar, Zambia, okay, Armenia, Mozambique, Thailand, Cameroon, uh, Cote d'Ivoire. All right, um, so we'll be using menti.com. Stay on that website because we'll be using it to collect input and ask you questions and you'll be able to participate in this webinar even more if you go to this website. So this may, new to, may, may be new to most of you. It's new to me personally, uh, but and I hope you'll enjoy and find it, uh, find it useful. So per, Pervez Yousaf who asks where to enter the code for menti. So go to the website menti.com and then actually you'll see there's only one thing on that page. There's the box where you type in the code 300536. Uh, All right. 
Okay, and I believe, um, if I'm not mistaken, we may have... Um, another uh, panelist. Um, I see, I just have to check first. Uh, so in the meantime, uh, connect to menti.com. It's going to be very important to full, fully participate in the webinar. Okay, I'm very pleased to see that uh, Jill Mill Bell, who's uh, responsible for capacity, uh, capacity building and who uh, uh, has been, um, who's started the uh, WHO Scholar Program in 2016, has, uh, has uh, joined us. Um, so I believe um, <clears throat> we will be starting with a word from her, a brief introduction from me, and then uh, uh, Laura Croft from Gavi and Jan Grevendonk from WHO will deep dive with no further ado into the uh, fascinating topic of data improvement plans. So, Jill Mill, would, would you like to uh, introduce yourself uh, to the uh, and, um, and also uh, introduce the WHO Scholar Program and say a word about this uh, webinar series for the Immunization Monitoring Academy? Yes, hello, everybody. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, or uh, good morning, wherever you are. So exciting that uh, we have so many participants, uh, even though we are... Um, uh, doing it digitally, I can still feel the excitement in the air, so it's really positive. Um, as Reda said, uh, my name is Jill Nilbal, and I am a capacity building and training officer at WHO HQ. And uh, we started with these scholar courses back in 2016, um, and based on the huge response we got at that time uh, from people like you, we have been regularly giving um, we're using the scholar approach to deliver different uh, course content. So I'm really excited about this new offering. Um, and basically, I just wanted to uh, mention that uh, w uh, WHO uh, uh, started with the scholar approach because it uh, relies heavily on adult learning strategies. Uh, it is coming out of uh, university of uh, uh, Illinois, Abana Champaign. We have really mastered the techniques of uh, adult learning, uh, which gives a lot of value to learners' past experience and the current and their current job context. So we, we believe that you as learners are not starting from scratch. You come with a lot of uh, past experience uh, uh, that you can uh, bring to this course and uh, help uh, your peers uh, as well uh, with your experience. Um, it relies heavily on peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning, as you would have uh, realized. There is already a lot of interaction has started um, in the scholar forum. Uh, so uh, the peer-to-peer -peer learning approach is the cornerstone uh, of uh, this scholar approach. And I really uh, encourage you all to participate uh, as much as you can. It will not only benefit and you as an individual, but also uh, help in uh, increasing the capacity of the entire group. So I'll stop here uh, uh, and wish you all the best for the course. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, uh, thank you, Jill Mill. Um, all right, I see many of you have discovered how to add your uh, country to the uh, Mentimeter. To so go to the website menti.com type in the code 300536. You can stay connected, obviously, to the webinar as you do that. We suggest if you're connecting to Zoom to the webinar from your uh, computer, from your desktop computer, use your phone to go to menti.com. That works very well. Uh, shall we now go to the ground rules? Uh, and Jan is, is, uh, is the uh, uh, master of Mentimeter who can take us to the next slide. So very briefly, and you know, usually we, we go very fast in these uh, when we do discussion groups and so on. Here today, we want to take the time to explain uh, what we're doing in house. So some of the ground rules, obviously, this, the intention is for you to be an active participant. There is a Q&A panel where you can actually ask your questions and um, we see the list of questions and other attendees can actually upvote. So you can vote by clicking on the little um, 
the, the little hand with the raised thumb. Uh, if you think it's a good question and you'd like an answer to it, then you should um, click on the raised thumb. That's within the Zoom webinar panel. So uh, that's the Q&A function. And we will not be taking questions with, via the chat. So if you have a question that you'd like Jan and Laura to try to get to or to consider, uh, use the Q&A panel. You also see these interactive features in Mentimeter. Um, so please use those as well uh, as you connect in two spaces at once. Uh, so you can view, yeah, uh, we ask you to be, of course, respectful of others when you comment. Um, there are people from many different backgrounds, many different countries, many different levels of experience and expertise. So please be mindful of that. And if you're very senior, very experienced, show indulgence for those uh, among us who may not be uh, as much uh, as, as, as you. Uh, there is a raise hand feature, and I see many of you have already raised your hands. Uh, so. We will have, we're going to try to reserve a bit of time and maybe if we find a really good question, we'll actually ask you to speak and tell us about it rather than uh, simply read your question. So um, now, right now we have very few questions that we've received, but we expect, expect many more given that there are 343 attendees currently in the room. So please do not be disappointed if, you're, if we're unable to answer your question uh, today. And in fact, um, Jan Grevendonk has uh, already set up uh, a resource folder. You can see it's tinyurl.com slash IMA hyphen resources. Uh, and you'll find further answers and resources. And I, I'm, I imagine that uh, Jan and Laura will be adding potentially you know, resources uh, in response to the questions that you ask, uh, uh, that you ask today. So there, I hope that is useful and provides us you know, so we can have a shared understanding of uh, what we can expect from today. So you've tried, you've put in your country using Mentimeter. Um, before I hand it over to Jan and Laura, yes, <laughs> I don't need to explain. Uh, please tell us where you work. We're keen to get a sense of who you are and to understand to, for, for Laura and Jan to better target. Um, all right, so we see right now, most people who have answered on menti.com and then you type in the code 300536 are telling us they're from the national uh, level, but we also have people from the state region province, uh, from the district, uh, global regional level, and the health facility. All right. Um, so right now, let me see, we've got 50, uh, uh, 56, 63, 80, we've got around 100 people. So a third of you have responded. Let's wait a little bit more. If you haven't yet figured out how to go to menti.com and then use the code 300536. Uh, it's very simple, preferably do it on your phone. You can switch back and forth. We've tested it and it worked um, to, you can actually keep listening to us on Zoom and go to menti.com and stay connected to the webinar and fully participate uh, by using this code 300536 on the website menti.com. All right. Uh, yes, for Abdul Salam. Well, if you're not hearing us, my oral answer is not. Yeah. Yes, we have started. Um, it may be a bandwidth issue, or you may need to connect to the audio. All right. We already have 17 questions, and I see some of you are testing. Must be testing the questions. Uh, so the Q and A feature is not necessarily. So yes, uh, uh, there's already. A question I'll answer from uh, Beatrice Mukherjee-Mweni. When will a French webinar be organized? So the French equivalent of this webinar on data improvement plans will be Tuesday. Uh, so six days from, uh, from today. Uh, so from a question from Gemma Balar, John, is the webinar going to be at the same time each week? Uh, no, we we're really working to get the best global experts on the different topics that the webinars will approach. And so we want to give them the flexibility with respect to the dates, but it will be at a similar date and time as close to the uh, uh, Wednesday or Thursday time that we can make as we can make it. All right. Um, so is there a certificate uh, after class? That's a question from Umar Babagoni. The answer is no. Uh, this is a webinar, not a 
class or course. Um, all right, and let me see if there are any other questions that are, okay, so for Mustafa Mahmoud, who does not have a phone nearby, unfortunately, that's fine. Just go to your web browser in your, on your computer and you can go to participate in the, uh, uh, in the Mentimeter. All right, uh, yes, and Nabil Liakat, yes, you've, uh, yeah, that's great. Uh, I believe so, there's a, uh, Navid Said has answered Nabil Liakat. Uh, so I'll mark that one as answered. Of course, as we get more questions, we expect, you know, don't hold it against us if we don't manage to keep up. <laughs> this is obviously a very dynamic group and there are now 369 of us. All right, let's, um, <clears throat> let me uh, uh, hand it over to uh, Laura Craw from Gavi and Jan Grevendonk. We can see a very healthy mix of, uh, of people from very different levels of immunization work here today in the room. And I hope you're, you're all as I am, uh, uh, expecting that you'll have a lot of enthusiasm uh, for this, for Laura's and Jan's presentation. Over to you, uh, Jan. So thank you, uh, Reda, for the introduction. And sorry for a little bit the, the delay in starting this webinar. There's a number of things we need to get right when we start with the Mentimeter and the Zoom. Uh, just to say, uh, the the interest from your part is overwhelming. It's quite humbling that there's almost 400 registered participants, people in the webinar right now, and 250 of you have managed to get to Menti, so that's also good. Let us first introduce ourselves. So my name is Jan Krevenank. I work at the World Health Organization in data. And next to me is uh, Laura Crow. Hello, everybody. Uh, as, I, as Jan just said, my name is Laura Craw. I work with Gavi here based in Geneva. Um, and I work in the monitoring and evaluation team. So we're going to tag team a bit this presentation. Um, let's go straight ahead. We have a number of slides. We'll try to keep it uh, a little bit short so that we also leave time for questions. So today, how are we going to structure it? So we're going to talk about data improvement plans. Um, so first of all, of course, the question, what is a data improvement plan really? Uh, a little bit of process to develop and implement it. Um, then we'll kind of go into the qualitative issues of a data improvement plan, saying what makes a plan strong, what can be improved. Uh, and then uh, Laura will actually help with the review of existing DIPs as Gavi countries uh, submitted them to Gavi. She will kind of uh, highlight a number of good practices and try to uh, talk through the challenges or the gaps that we see from that perspective. Um, then later we can discuss how we can improve the process and how we can keep on learning to make kind of better data improvement plans, not just for Gavi's sake, but also and especially because we uh, think that is data improvement plans are a good vehicle for a country to kind of start plan and organize their uh, improvement activities around for their countries or for districts or health facilities or whatever your context might be. Then we'll take some uh, Q&A and discussion, but actually before we do that, we we'll also want to introduce the next webinars. So this is only uh, one in a series of six webinars that are uh, related to the course we're doing uh, with the Immunization Monitoring Academy, um, but basically uh, open to everybody. So this first one is about the vehicle, about the data improvement plans. The next one will actually try to give uh, or help people think of, through some of the solutions or some of the recommendations and the things that work out there uh, to improve data availability, quality and use. Right, um, let me get started. So first of all, what do we improve exactly? What is a data improvement plan? So some of you might actually know the term uh, data quality improvement plan, DQIP. Uh, so that's the same thing, data quality improvement plan or a data improvement plan. It doesn't really matter for us. It's kind of a rebranding that is aimed to, to uh, convey the message that it's more about availability, quality and use than quality in a narrow definition. So what we really, um, feel strong about is that uh, use of data that is uh, useful, so of high quality, uh, should lead to program improvement. So whatever can be used to take decisions that strengthen programs uh, is relevant for us. Um, what is the definition of data quality? Well, there's a number of definitions out there and you might have heard definitions around accurate, precise, timely, complete. Um, for us, what really matters is that the data are useful. So usefulness is data quality for us. So fit for purpose is another word that you might use. Um, so whether the data are timely, complete, precise, accurate enough for the decisions that you need to take. So it really depends on those decisions, what you need them for, 
and then try to find the right data that can answer that, that is uh, giving the, you at least the right signals, right? So there's a lot of theory uh, behind that that I'm going to spare you uh, with, um, but uh, we'll put something in the resource folders also that, that might um, give you some more background. Um, before we go further though, let, uh, why don't you grab your phones and take part in the next little quiz? And we wanted to ask you what you think the most important barriers are to data quality and use, right? Is it a lack of data use culture? Are they inefficient systems? For example, duplicative or hard to use systems? Is it that forms are not available in the health facilities, health facilities for example? Is it the case of over-reporting and under-reporting? Are denominators inaccurate? Is there a lack of clear processes or is there a lack of funding? So we gave you some options. And if you go to Mentimeter, so menti.com, um, there will be a little quiz on your phone and you can allocate 100 points to these uh, questions. And one person already found how to do that. And the person gave 30 points to each of those three things. So lack of data use culture, over-reporting and reporting and inaccurate denominators. But you can allocate your points, your 100 points as you see fit across these categories. So you can give 10 to each, or you can give 100 to one, or you can give 1.1 1 .1 and 99 to everything else. Um, so it's up to you, but just to get a, a sense of the uh, prioritization of what you think the most uh, severe barriers are to data quality and use. And I'll give that some time because this kind of question takes a little bit longer because you have to figure out how the point system work. It's, it's actually quite easy, but once you do it once, it will be easier for the next time. Um, the 28 people, 30, have found it out. Um, and right now the inaccurate denominators are going head to head with uh, denominators, uh, with uh, data use culture. Um, give it a little bit more time. So yes, a lot of you seem to think that uh, either denominators and lack of data use culture are very important barriers. Uh, I probably personally agree with that. Uh, there are some, also some of the hardest thing to address. Uh, so we'll have to um, think well about how to solve these things. What we try to uh, orient people towards is kind of try to solve things that are within their control and not to waste too much energies on things that are outside of their control. For example, if there's a census and you have to use the census data for denominators, then it's probably not worth fighting that politically. But you can try to kind of do target setting based on different uh, sources, etc. So the good thing is also we'll have actually uh, the, the third webinar that we plan is on the data use culture and data workforce capacity and data use. And I think the fourth is on target setting and denominator. So uh, right there, we're on the money. So. Um, wait a few weeks and we'll have specific seminars around those. Um, Over-reporting is also like a, a big issue in certain countries at least, where kind of incentives have really led to skewed reporting, uh, where people are really asked to, to give high coverage numbers rather than the accurate ones. Uh, inefficient systems, duplicative systems especially, that's something that's a big problem in many countries still, especially with um, where parallel systems for EPI exist together with kind of the HMIS or the National Health um, Management Information Systems, such as DHIS2. We will also do a webinar on, on that, on DHIS2 specifically. So that's also good to see that that's a priority for many of you. Uh, lack of clear processes seems to be a little bit of less of an issue. Uh, lack of funding is also less of, less of an issue and the forms that are not available at the health facility level. Uh, you don't think that's a big issue. Um, we actually got data that it might be more of an issue than what you think. A lot of countries actually report stockouts, for example, of the home-based records or the vaccination cards, which means that really the, the program is hard to, to monitor without that. And some of you picked up on that and forms not available is now not last, but second to last mm -hmm. at least. So thanks, uh, that's, we're going to move on. Uh, sorry for everybody who didn't get to vote on this. Um, it will take quite a while to wait for all the votes to get in, but I think uh, this way you get to think about what the barriers are and, and how do you prioritize them. So 20, 220 people voted out of 400 almost, let's call that a good coverage. So what is a DIP, a data improvement plan? So it's really simple. It's a document that assesses the barriers that limit data availability, quality, and use of immunization data. It's just, just the ones that you talked about right now. And that plans for implementation of actionable and impactful recommendations. 
Uh, so it typically contains like some kind of assessment and diagnosis, for example, about your systems, about your data. Uh, it might have like the findings of a field review. Uh, it should have recommendations, kind of targeted recommendations, a plan of action, and talk about the implementation and the monitoring and evaluation of all this. Um, so that is kind of what we expect from a data improvement plan. Uh, just to say that a data improvement plan can be part of something bigger, it can be part of something else, but we think it's important that especially with a lot of partners coming in many countries and kind of helping countries out with data, that there is kind of one national plan or one plan for your context that uh, tries to, call, tries to uh, get everybody uh, motivated around common objectives. And that is based on evidence and has a prioritized plan of action. Moving on from this slide. The process, how do you make it? Uh, and this is a bit of a hard slide to look at. And what we're actually going to do is I'm going to invite you to look at the resource folder where just after this webinar, I will put uh, a handbook and the handbook talks about the process at length, especially in chapter three, where you talk about how to assess and improve data quality. Um, but basically what we propose is that uh, everybody starts with kind of a diagnosis of their uh, context which could start with a system, for example, a system in a broad sense where you look at people, tools, processes, and governance, and think about the strengths, the strengths and the weaknesses uh, of that system. Then you should also look at the data itself, like just open your data and see if you find outliers, uh, timeliness issues. Um, what the trends say is that all kind of uh, uh, consistent. Uh, can you triangulate with other kinds of data just to look at what the data has to tell you itself? And then the next step is that in many countries, you will feel the need to actually go to the field to, um, to ask people on what they think should be done or how they interact with data, how, can they use, how they can use data or cannot use data and find out what some of the root causes are for um, bad data quality. Uh, you can also do data verification where you kind of compare data across different sources, for example, registers versus tele sheets versus reports. Then going into the improvement plan, um, we'll talk about all this later, but there's a phase of some root cause analysis to make sure you don't just address the symptoms, but also the, the real root causes of the problems, um, where you have to go through some kind of process of prioritization and come up with a, an actionable plan or an action plan. Um, Laura then said, actually, it's very important that we add this fifth category to that. So this is not in the handbook, but I agree it's important, where we start, start thinking about implementation and monitoring of the plan even before we go ahead and, and implement the activities. So you implement, you monitor progress, and you evaluate your interventions. Right, so I'm not going to dwell too much on this a little bit complicated slide, uh, but just to say that everything that's in, that's in all of these boxes is kind of uh, explained in more length in the monitoring handbook that you will find in the resource folder just after this webinar. Uh, then the next, step so we said okay we have like this vehicle we have an action plan a data improvement plan that is in place in many countries uh, now we start getting uh, the results of that we start seeing that many countries uh, are making one or even submitting that to gavi now the question the next question is is what is the quality of those plans um, so to be able to say that we probably have to think about what makes a plan strong or not um, so a good plan in our opinion if you look at the basics of that is first of all that the diagnosis is based on evidence, not opinions. So it's not good enough if somebody says, well, I think that um, in my country, uh, the problem is denominators. Uh, and hence uh, the action is we need to improve denominators and we say this to the Census Bureau. So that's not good enough. Actually, we need to have some kind of analytical step first that says, okay, can we really kind of get evidence of the problems and evidence about what the root, cause of, root causes are of those problems. Um, second, there needs to be recommendations or whatever you want to call them, but IDs for improvement. Um, those recommendations, so high level IDs of big things you want to improve, they need to pr be prioritized. So we don't have a right number, but uh, just keeping in mind that 50 things are probably uh, hard to implement, right? If you have 50 big teams that you're going to work around in your country next year and next five years, that's going to be really hard to follow up on, to implement, to get money for. So you will probably have to prioritize uh, in terms of what is impactful and what is feasible. Um, recommendations also need to address the root causes of the problem. So for example, with the, I just mentioned the example of if you think that denominators are bad, your recommendation cannot be to improve denominators. Your recommendation should try to find out 
why recommend why denominators are not useful so uh, is it because the census is old because um, it uses different growth rates etc and before you make actually a recommendation for improvement think about what is really underlying those issues uh, another example that is is maybe easier to think about is if you find out that people don't use data for action right so there's a lot of different reasons why why that might not be the case and we'll come back to that but the recommendation cannot be for people to use data so that's not a useful recommendation what you need to find out is why people are not using data and if it's for example because they're overworked we need to think about how to reduce their workloads and that becomes more actionable um, feasible and actionable recommendations uh, that's also very important because many of the recommendations we see we would not be happy getting for example and being um, put in our work plan so I think if you can really ask yourself, would this be something I would be happy taking on next year, right? Um, then it's probably feasible. If it's not, then it's probably not feasible. Um, also very important, are they potentially impactful? So some things are very feasible, but wouldn't make a difference at all. So we also don't wanna see a lot of those. Um, third, that the plan be built around smart objectives. We'll talk a bit more about that and describe how the plan will be implemented and monitored. Um, for example, through uh, HSS funding, TCA funding, uh, through partner interventions, whatever, or through government budgets, uh, but who will be doing it, uh, who will be uh, implementing it, and how will we know that it works, right? So with that, we're going to some examples, and I'm almost ready to hand it over to Laura, uh, but we'll first do a Mentimeter thing, um, right? So first of all, to say that how many countries have data improvement plans, Short answers, 37 pro countries have formally shared the IPs with Gavi. Now that doesn't mean that there's not more of those plans out there, but not necessarily formally shared with Gavi. And also saying that a lot of countries um, that are not Gavi countries could also be benefiting from a plan like that. Uh, really again, what, it's, it, what it is about is to make sure that all partners, all levels of the ministry um, and all stakeholders agree on common objectives and goals, and then have like some priorities to improve um, the situation of data availability, quality, and use in their country. Um, so we, we have these uh, examples that Laura will introduce and we'll have them uh, step by step. So the first step is on the system assessment. Just to say that the system, if we, if we say system assessment, we don't necessarily only talk about the computer system. So the computer system is part of this, uh, but there's many building blocks of a system. So there's a foundation of governance as we call it, um, there's the tools and the systems, including the forms, including the home-based records and how that is all designed. There are the processes, uh, there are the people, the very important part of the system, that if all these building blocks are in place, you can actually have uh, meaningful data use, right? So when we say system assessment, it can be about all these things, not just about the computer system. Um, quick Mentimeter question before I hand it over to Laura. And the question is, if you would have to ad uh, assess uh, your system, right? Um, which approaches would you think are most useful to do that? Uh, would you like to review forms and computer systems, make a SWOT analysis, or SWOT is strengths, weakness, opportunities, and threats, map the data flow? Would you like to interview data users or review previous assessments? And I wanted to, you, you to prioritize a bit, so not you can't say all five of them are important, so you can actually have three votes, I think, each two or three, I'm not sure if I remember well, um, but just to see if we can have like a little bit of um, preferences. Right, and for many people, the making a SWOT analysis seems like a good approach to uh, assess uh, the system. That's maybe because we said it's an output of that first phase. Um, review forms and computer systems uh, can actually be quite useful, especially like if you take the monthly form and really critically look at it and see, okay, what data are you really asking people to collect uh, and how are we using that? I think that could be a good exercise. The SWOT analysis is nice because it brings everything nicely together and it allows for the input of many stakeholders. Um, map the data flows can also unearth kind of bottlenecks in those data flows uh, with the systems, for example, that you use or with the deadlines that are um, there for data reporting. Interview the users of the data can also be extremely valuable, whether you do that individually or in a, in a focus group discussion, uh, but interviewing people who actually get to use data and find out if the data fits their needs is, is really important. 
And of course, finally, um, previous assessments are there. They're a good resource. Um, so every system assessment should probably start with that. Um, and you might not find everything that is in there, but that's okay. You can then plan on, on how to get uh, that evaluation going forward. So just to say in this question, there was not a right answer. I, all answers are valid. I just wanted you to think through about these steps and how at least you would be to do them. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Laura to actually talk about what she found when she reviewed uh, that improvement plans that were submitted to Gavi. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so we decided to give you a bit of flavor from what we're seeing um, upon a review of data improvement plans that have been submitted to Gavi. Here you can see um, what we're going to do each time is run through just some small examples of some good examples that we're seeing coming through countries. So here, for example, is an example from Guinea. Um, here you can see uh, they have done um, and documented their SWOT analysis. So just taking, for example, here their first um, area that they're digging into is related to human resources capacity. And here you can see they've really gone in and um, they've, they've queried in terms of what things are working well, where do they have some strengths, and, um, where do they have their weaknesses, and then they've brainstormed around opportunities related to human resources and their health workforce, and then also documented their threats. One thing that we're seeing from countries that we uh, often find quite helpful um, is doing this through some sort of workshop. So it's a, a live discussion across multiple colleagues from different teams. So you get inputs from not just EPI colleagues, for example, but also colleagues from HMIS teams or all other teams involved in data as well. Moving on. Um, We can also see here some good examples um, in terms of systems assessment. So as Jan said, um, a very good process to follow um, and part of your assessment is to go through and think around data flows. So here are two examples. These are real examples taken from Mozambique and Angola. And here you can see they've really gone through and they've mapped the data flows right from the facility level all the way through up their systems to the national level. Um, I would mention that from a review of the plans, um, sometimes this is quite challenging and sometimes you need to think beyond just programmatic data, but maybe if data flows are different, um, it is worth looking into them for surveillance as well, for example. Sometimes they're not exactly the same. Again, to Jan's point, this probably means that we need to be speaking to a, a variety of colleagues um, and especially in, in these times where we're seeing complex systems, new tools being brought in and um, these over time will probably have to be revisited and updated so if you're making changes to your systems and your tools then these data flow maps probably need to be regularly looked at and understood this is a great way to also uh, reflect on efficiencies and also reflect on roles and responsibilities within your systems in terms of challenges so upon the review Sorry, Laura. Of the yeah, there's a there's some concerns from the, some of the attendees um, who are asking uh, why the examples are given in French or Spanish or Portuguese. I'm not sure which one, and if there are English language examples available. Yes, absolutely, and we can make those available um, uh, later on. And um, obviously, we, what we've done is we've taken nice examples from the suite of Gavi countries. So we're fortunate that we've we've got lots of them. So happy to share um, other examples in English as well. In terms of challenges, um, we often see assessments that are not comprehensive in nature. So one thing that we saw was um, sometimes countries uh, through their plans, they maybe are doing certain aspects relatively well. So maybe they do a good job at doing their data flow mapping, but then they haven't actually gone on to describe and review the actual information systems um, and thought beyond programmatic or coverage data, for example. So as I mentioned, also considering stock related data or VPD surveillance data can be very important as well. Right, so I'll take the floor. And I think it's really nice actually now to see that the theory is being kind of uh, checked with the country. So we can make uh, more uh, examples available. We can even see if we make all the data improvement plans available for people. Let's see that. 
but it, it's actually nice to actually uh, see from practice and, and, and see how people fill that in. So the next step we said it was going to be the data desk review. So in a data desk review, uh, you're going to be a little of a detective, basically. You're going to take your red marker and find out if their outliers are data consistent um, and actually dig deep into the data. So this is something that maybe not everything is, everybody's going to be comfortable with, but at least data managers or kind of epidemiologists and people are very comfortable with, with data should be uh, having like some way to take a large set of data and find out what could be going wrong with that. Um, oh dear. All right. So we're going to start again with a Mentimeter rather than give you a, a lot of theory. And we're going to ask you uh, how comfortable you are with uh, these steps in data desk review. And I think this is a sliding scale, so you can just uh, slide the level of comfortability from one to five, whether you uh, feel that you're equipped or you kind of, um, you know how to do this uh, for each of these things. So completeness, timeliness analysis, uh, detecting inconsistent indicators, for example, coverage over 100% uh, or dropout that is negative or wastage that is negative. Um, detecting inconsistencies between indicators, for example, uh, DTP3 is very different from OPV3, uh, or yellow fever is very different from MCV1. Um, detecting outliers, so values that are really uh, much uh, lower or higher than you think they should be. Comparing survey and administrative data, or even maybe triangulating between survey and administrative data. So looking not just, not just at one set of uh, data to make a performance analysis, but looking at many sets. Um, the same for logistics and administrative data. So do, do the doses add up to the coverage? Uh, and finally, triangulating between coverage and surveillance data. So disease, disease outbreak versus surveillance data. And people have also found how to do this. So that's great. And what you say is that completeness and timeliness, um, most of people are comfortable with. And I think that's uh, common practice in many countries. That's, that's fine. Uh, detecting inconsistent indicators. Uh, you probably also are more comfortable than, than you realize. But we mean with, what I mean with that is basically just that you can find uh, coverage over 100% and say, well, that's probably not right. Or a dropout rate, rate between one and three that is negative and also say, okay, well, there's something wrong there as well. Or wastage that is negative. Um, that's also something that shouldn't really be happening. Detecting inconsistencies between indicators. Uh, it's relatively straightforward also, like doses yeah, are given a, at the same time. And we have a question from our participants that actually came up in the chat. Um, could you uh, explain how to distinguish detecting inconsistencies between indicators from inconsistent indicators? Right. Yes, I, to be honest, I just made it up. Uh, uh, bef so this is not a set, uh, set of rules, uh, just to set, lay that out. But all of these are inconsistencies, internal inconsistencies in the data, right? Uh, so first of all, we know that indicators, when we calculate them, they should be consistent in a way that, for example, um, if you look at coverage, for example, and coverage is over 100%, we know that either the denominator or the denominator is wrong. So that is an inconsistency within the de definition of that, cal within the calculation of that indicator. Or if dropout is negative, um, we know there's something wrong with the calculation of that indicator itself. Uh, so this is something that is, is just like a matter of, okay, there's something that goes into the calculation of the indicator that is wrong. Detecting inconsistencies between indicators is really looking at, um, well, within immunization, for example, uh, vaccines that are given at the same time, do we get more or less uh, equal or uh, comparable uh, numbers with those? because if one number is much higher than the other one, it might be a program issue, but it might also be a data quality issue. Uh, if you look at uh, cross programs, uh, you can even take that further and, and say that, for example, A and C um, indicators, for example, um, uh, neonatal uh, visits or antenatal visits, for example, uh, there should also be some consistency between that and, and what BCG should say. Um, or the denominators that are used for one program should also be a bit consistent between with indicator with denominators for, for for EPI, so that's just to say that. Um, yes, I know it's maybe confusing the language, but it's it's easier than you think. 
Um, detecting outliers are just values that are much higher or much lower than uh, we expect them to be. For example, um, a common example is the fat finger mistake where people actually put in two zeros where they wanted to put in one zero. So all of a sudden you have 9,006 instead of 906. Um, right. Uh, some of the outliers can also be real programmatic uh, effects, for example, because um, because we did a routine immunization intensification or effort or something like that. Uh, but, they, but they can also kind of uh, point to data quality issues. So comparing survey and administrative data, that's actually something that's very important. We spent a lot of money on surveys, but then people feel hesitant to really kind of take those surveys and say, okay, what does it teach us about the administrative data? Are they on track or not? Comparing logistics and administrative data, and administrative data is something that is just about starting, but it's also quite important. So as you realize, you can't really uh, vaccinate more children than, than you use vaccines, for example. So that's one thing. Um, Gavi is also very interested in this team because it creates, it should create a bit of accountability around vaccine usage as vaccines are getting more expensive. What we really like to see is that uh, if you use X vaccines, um, this corresponds to um, X children being vaccinated, or at least a minimum number of them. And then finally, the, the last question is very interesting, but quite difficult. Uh, but yes, uh, if you have coverage data, we should be able to be able to, for example, challenge coverage data if we see a lot of disease outbreaks. Uh, it's not that easy. So I think I agree with you that uh, your level of comfort might be variable across these things. And in the IMA course, we will try to uh, solve a number of these things or help you give you a number of tools to, to help you with those uh, uh, strategies. Um, and also in the handbook, you will find more explanation about this. Handing it back over to Laura for examples from the fields. Okay, um, so as, as Jan just introduced, um, there are several aspects to a desk review. Upon the review from countries, and again, we can share more uh, examples in English, um, we saw in general that um, countries tend to be quite good in terms of completeness and timeliness um, and are quite routinely looking at these um, and discussing these. Uh, of course, you can do that in different forms. There's different ways to present that analysis. Um, and I would also say that in some regions, what we're now seeing, um, for example, in African region, that we're now bringing together, um, the regional offices are now bringing together colleagues to actually perform these desk reviews together and do peer reviews across these desk reviews, which um, so far we've had very positive feedback about um, and people have found that very helpful. Um, on to the next one. To Jan's point, um, this offers a really good opportunity in a desk review to actually compare across data sources. So this is a nice example from Uganda. Um, which is comparing number of doses reported through different means. So here you can see on the left, they've actually gone in and looked very closely at monthly reported data um, compared to the child register. Um, that's looking at PENTA-3 coverage. Um, and on the right, they're looking at the difference between monthly reported paper-based and then what's coming through DHIS-2 at district level. Um, these types of analyses, particularly with countries moving towards DHIS-2, can actually be quite helpful and give you confidence to understand um, how well those new systems and tools are being used. In terms of challenges, um, what we saw overall is that um, often there is a desk review. Um, it quite often covers parts of data quality. Um, and as we said, completeness and timeliness um, comes out really as top, um, as most routinely being looked at. Uh, I thought it was interesting when Jan opened it up on Mentimeter as well, but that's where we feel as a community, we have the most confidence in performing those types of analyses. Uh, similar to the Mentimeter, um, we saw triangulation coming through, but not in every case. Now to Jan's point, this does actually sometimes prove a little bit challenging. Um, we do need to think about uh, triangulation and think about the question we're asking, perhaps before uh, going ahead with the analysis. And one thing that I would say is um, WHO and CDC are actually now working together um, on developing some additional guidance related to triangulation. Um, after speaking with countries and doing this review, 
we saw that there's, there probably is a bit of a gap um, in guidance out there about how to go about that. So that guidance has been developed. We hope it will be available um, uh, next year for, for countries to start using. And um, the idea behind that is very much to think around some basic core triangulation analyses and then some more advanced analyses. So we hope over time um, that we, be, we will be able to show more examples um, and also strengthen people's confidence in performing these types of analyses. Right, so moving on to the third box of that schedule that you saw, which was the field review. Um, so field reviews is maybe, maybe the thing that a lot of people are most comfortable with because we have been doing this through DQAs, DQSs, uh, DQRs, SARAs uh, over the years. Um, so for people who have done it uh, or people who have an opinion about this, what do you think is most useful in a field review? Is it data verification, your collection of qualitative data, your uh, opportunity to observe practices in the field? Uh, an opportunity to understand health worker motivation or is it the debrief at the end that you get to give to the colleagues in the Ministry of Health? And while you vote, I'll just uh, say a little bit more about all these steps. So the data verification is really uh, something that was introduced in the DQA in 2000, uh, which is just really a very uh, simple uh, means of uh, comparing data across different sources. So it's very similar to what uh, Laura said, showed you before. You can take data, collect data, harvest data from different points and then say, well, the data that should be the same, are they the same, right? And that kind of tells you a little bit about how data are being treated as they are reported up the chain. So uh, it's a very kind of hard measure of uh, finding out whether data is maybe not accurate, but at least consistent uh, across uh, the reporting system. The second one, collecting uh, qualitative data. So yes, you can find out uh, more about practices. You can say uh, how well people are technically trained or capacity is there. Uh, you can see in how many places the monitoring chart is there, etc. And you can try to make sense of that at the aggregate level. But maybe even more useful, as you say, it's like going through that questionnaire allows you to observe practices and go into depth into all of the aspects of a monitoring system including uh, understanding the health workers motivation, which I think um, is quite important. And this is the only place where you actually get to do this, where you get to talk with health workers and really say, okay, why are you using data or why not? Or how would you use data uh, if, if you had better data, et cetera. Uh, debrief at the Ministry of Health, um, you think it's probably less important. Um, even though like I find that uh, the exercise of having people kind of make sense of what they learned in the field and have and, and put that in a few uh, PowerPoints and give them an opportunity, for example, to talk to maybe even the Minister of Health and everything, or at least the director of the department or the EPI team uh, is always a good opportunity to kind of uh, give some visibility to the subject also. Um, with that, uh, handing it back over to uh, Laura, and I'm giving you just a few more minutes to vote, a few more seconds. So again, here we can see um, we came across quite a number of, of good examples in these field reviews and in-depth assessments. So Mozambique on the left um, is a good example of data verification, which Jan already talked through. Um, and we've included Rwanda because um, it, it's a nice example where upon digging in a little bit further um, through the field review, they were actually able to um, synthesize their findings quite well. So here you can see, for example, um, they actually saw that the lead causes of discrepancies were um, around counting errors or, or human error. Um, and they were actually able to quantify that um, from their assessment saying that accounted for 72% of, of the issues that they saw. Um, so really saying by going out, digging in, seeing, seeing these things, and particularly um, speaking with health workers themselves and observing the practices, all of which we just covered in the Mentimeter, can actually get a much richer, greater understanding um, of the issues. One other tip that we've seen from, from countries as well, doing these field reviews, is, is the importance of your, your SWOT analysis beforehand to really um, drive a little bit and think about how you're maybe going to adapt or focus your field review before you go out, because you can actually go in with some 
hypotheses or thoughts um, around things that you might want to dig into a little bit further. In terms of challenges, um, one thing that we, we, we did see um, and that's um, most commonly uh, sort of portrayed as a good example is to have a little bit of an outsider in perspective in, involved in the uh, field reviews. So ideally have an element of independence. So whether this is um, using some technical partners, for example, um, to come in and help facilitate that, um, because quite often if you bring in others um, who have perhaps done this in other countries, they can help give you some suggestions in terms of questions, they can perhaps give advice vis-a-vis um, -vis protocol, and certainly from a, a Gavi perspective, this is an area where we've seen quite a lot of technical assistance um, proving to be very helpful. Um, and then leading on to the next section, uh, we often saw through, through our review that the in-depth assessment and field review reports are actually very rich in nature, but then actually where unfortunately they're maybe falling down a little bit is sometimes they just stay as a nice report themselves. So it's then that translation of the findings of the report, the findings of your review, and what does this mean in terms of next steps and ultimate improvements. All right, so that's interesting. So from what Laura is saying, I think what we really detect is that, that the bottleneck or maybe the, the challenge really here, the big one is where it goes from the analysis to the, from the diagnosis and the analysis to the recommendations and really try to make that actionable. So we thought about that and, and this is maybe something that even in the handbook that you will find this, it's not that well developed. Um, but how, how can we really go from a good diagnosis to a good plan where we know that the diagnosis is good? something in the middle is missing there. So we thought, okay, okay, so what do we want people really to do? And the first thing is by your good cause analysis. And I have a little Mentimeter exercise about that. Uh, the second part would be prioritization because I think those were the two big issues that we saw. Um, and just to kind of get more of a feel of what root causes are and what we mean by that, right? Because like if an issue, for example, or a problem that you can detect detect is a lack of data use or lack of data use culture or something like that. What you find is that people don't seem to be interested in using data, right? Uh, what we often see then in plans, what actually happens is that um, people say, okay, there's a lack of data use, hence my recommendation is to do training, right? So we want to kind of change that a bit and actually say, let's not jump to that conclusion, but let's first think about why there might be a lack of data use. Uh, is it because there might be high work workload. Is it because uh, people may lack the motivation to use data for some kind of reason? Is it because they lack the technical capacity? Is because even if they know how to do it and they have time to do it, they lack, their, they lack the resources, for example, so they're not empowered to act upon them. So they can't really change budgets, for example. Um, is it because of lack of guidance from center level on how to use data? Or it's sometimes because data are just not useful. So it's low quality data, not useful data. So uh, why would we expect they, people to be using it if the data that we give them is not useful, right? Um, and to some extent, I think a, a number of you all agree that all of these might be um, uh, root causes of lack of data use culture. So this is also not to say that there's, there's not going to be a right answer or wrong answer. I think it will be very heavily dependent on your context. And that's also why the field review becomes so important because really what you need to find out now if you, for example, see that uh, people don't use data because the workload is too high, because they're basically spending 30% of their time on administrative tasks, and that's already too much for a clinician, right? And we agree with that. So what can we do about the workload? And then probably we have to ask more behind the root causes behind that high workload. So there's a rule um, of five in uh, root cause analysis that you can ask up to five times why. So if you say, why are people not using data? Well, their workload is too high. They can still ask, why is the workload so high? So maybe it is because uh, we ask for too many things to be recorded, or maybe there's uh, two parallel systems and it's double work, or maybe it's because the tools are not user friendly, et cetera, et cetera. So there's like, and for each of these things, you can still ask why before you start to address um, the problem. Uh, and by doing this, 
kind of root cause analysis and digging deeper, we hope that people can come up with more specific, more targeted recommendations and interventions, right? Because if you don't ask that question up front, then later you will say, how do I do this recommendation? If you don't ask, why is the problem there? So that about root causes, moving on. Uh, in the handbook, just to say there's a few other examples of root causes. Uh, a lot of this is basically um, coming from engineering actually and mechanics that root cause analysis. So why is my car not starting in the morning? Well, maybe the battery is flat and why is the battery flat? Well, and there's like uh, other uh, root causes behind that. Um, but just to say that depending on what, uh, what uh, root cause you're going for, your action will actually be different. For example, in the handbook, we, we say, for example, that if you find uh, many mistakes and outliers uh, during your data review, and you find during the field review and data verification that the mistakes are introduced at district level, then that is something else from the health facility level, for example, then you will probably have to see what's going wrong at the district level. So then in that qualitative part of the questionnaire and your review of the system, you may be found that the computer system is difficult to use, right? And that the data entry screen does not match the paper form. And then now we come to the level of something that is really kind of concrete enough for us to start addressing. So this is a bit the idea behind the root cause analysis. And we think that a lot of the quality on, on what is going to be recommended is going to depend on how, how well uh, you're able to do this root cause analysis. So with that, I'm going to uh, give the floor to, to talk to some examples from the field. So apologies for the, the poor quality of the image here. We can make sure we, we make this available so you can see it in more depth. But we have seen um, some, some good examples coming through from countries, uh, again, um, related to these analyses. So here's a nice one from Nigeria, where they started out with a problem statement as we think we have issues with data quality. And here you can say they've really unpacked this and thought around monitoring and use of data for decision making. They've thought through tools and technology. They've thought through policy aspects, which is something uh, we don't always see being um, queried and, and reflected upon. So that was good to see. Uh, processes, human resource capacity, and, and data warehousing, um, as well as, as the lack of a plan. So uh, a nice example there of, of country colleagues really going in depth, uh, thinking through, uh, again, uh, a nice example where they brought in colleagues from different, sec different um, parts of the immunization program to really brainstorm together. Um, and, and nice to see there's a lot of love coming through from that, for that example uh, from participants. Moving on. Another one from Mozambique. And again, here you can see um, there's lots of different ways to, to go about doing these as well and to document these. So um, this is a nice example on the left. For example, here you can see they started out with the problem statement of uh, having coverage for Penta 1 um, over 100% in around about 70% of their districts. And here you can see it's a really nice reflection of how complex some of the issues are that we're dealing with. Um, uh, data means a lot uh, to a lot of people. It's part of a lot of people's job. So you really have to unpack and ask um, lots of different questions through this root cause analysis. Um, and again, to, to stress the example that Jan, Jan used, what we really are trying to avoid here is um, that we have issues with data quality. Therefore, we need to do some more training on data quality really want to go um, a few steps further and think through to make sure that our actions are well targeted to the actual issues. Um, in terms of prioritization, uh, to Jan's point, there's lots of different ways to do it, um, but it's a very important step. Otherwise, we risk a, a really large set of recommendations. Uh, that is something that we saw through the review of the plan submitted to us, um, that sometimes we were seeing a really quite a large number of, of actions, recommendations put forth. And therefore, um, this is a nice example top right where you can see Mozambique uh, is actually weighed across um, level of effort versus level of impact. And what we would like to see in those examples is probably the major products. So those in the top right being taken forward, Ghana did it slightly differently where they've gone through and they've really tried to prioritize on a level of, of one to three across their, their required um, activities. The other thing that I would stress is um, 
thinking about who is available to take forward these, these activities and whether you require technical assistance to take them forward um, in your discussion about prioritization. Right, thank you very much. Just to say that from my point of view, and we can discuss that of course, but if you make a plan, it should be a good balance between kind of challenging major projects that make a high impact, but you shouldn't forget the quick wins because quick wins are often easy to do and you can make a lot of progress just by doing it. And just the fact that you're starting to work on something is all already valuable in itself. Um, so yes. Um, implementation and monitoring then. So first of so thinking on how can we now bring it all together. Uh, so we talked about a lot of this already. I'm not going to go too deep into that. Uh, in your handbook, you, fin you will find a little bit more, but just to say that if we able to uh, get to the root causes and then we kind of try to match those two uh, objectives and activities, that's really where the magic starts to happen. So we say that we want our objectives to be smart again as with everything here, so we suggest a number of methodologies that you can use or kind of object uh, terms and methods. Uh, but if you're more comfortable with another approach that go gets you to the same results, that's fine for us, of course. For example, the fish bone in Nigeria is as good as uh, the SWOT or the root cause analysis uh, we show. So we would, we would endorse uh, local creativity. Uh, just to say that as long as in a plan, we have some kind of sense that uh, objectives are specific enough that they can be measured in terms of um, their outcome can be uh, evaluated. Um, there, um, I'm now blanking on what the A is. Um, actionable. Actionable, I'm not sure. Because R is uh, realistic and T is time bound. Um, but anyway, so it's an acronym that stands for a number of things. So what we want, what we want you to do is have like a plan that has like, that is time bound, you can say, who is doing what by when, and how are we going to know that it has happened? So that's actually the most important part of this. Um, and then handing it over to Laura, who is actually more of an m and &E person than I am, I think, so I'll let the master talk. Uh, master, that's very polite. Um, so here again, um, something that we just wanted to stress from reviewing them is uh, the, the time-bound nature of these plans. Uh, so here's an example from, from Lao PDR, um, where you can see that they've actually gone through and thought about leave responsible parties um, and timelines noted. This was where we did observe um, looking across plans. This step was quite often not done or done um, at a very light level. Um, so what we did see with some countries is that they were producing really thoughtful um, activities, recommendations, but then roles and responsibilities were not clear at the, at the end stage. Therefore, when we came back a year later, maybe asked them how they were progressing against those activities, one of the, the places where they'd stalled was a confusion over who exactly was going to take forward what, um, and then thinking through, uh, given the, the huge amount of workload that we know are upon EPI teams, uh, really what a realistic time frame to, to complete those activities looked like, looked like. One thing that I would say is I think sometimes um, we think we have to address everything in a few years. Data is a marathon. Um, improving data, strengthening data use, that's not going to happen overnight. Um, that's something that we appreciate is actually very, very challenging. We know there's high turnover, turnover of health workers, for example. So really trying to be realistic in the timelines you're talking about as well um, is very important. Another um, quick note on budget um, is one thing that we saw was sometimes countries um, are starting a little bit from their budget envelope and working backwards. We'd much prefer to see it done the other way, um, where we're really thinking about what absolutely needs to be done and then thinking realistically what resourcing um, is required. And this point around sustainability. So um, obviously we've only reviewed the subset um, for, for the Gavi countries, but we're often seeing that these improvement plans are 100% reliant on one or two donors, um, which again is, a, is an issue if we're talking about ongoing um, capacity strengthening, and that's something probably we need to think about with more of a sustainability lens. 
in terms of monitoring the implementation, um, it's important to think through uh, key metrics that we want to be tracked um, and how we'll implement, uh, monitor the implementation progress. Um, I would stress that uh, who is going to review the implementation progress. So most countries now, um, you, you have some sort of quarterly reviews um, at your district levels. You have your annual EPI reviews, perhaps at the national level. You also will likely have some sort of working group set up. I know in, in Africa, for example, we are now seeing a growing number of countries having actual data working groups. These are all groups that can be incredibly helpful um, to, to review progress and make sure we're keeping on track. The final point that I would just say is um, keeping focus on what evaluations may be required. So thinking through, if you've got a new tool um, or approach that you're using and you're not sure if it's going to work or not, then perhaps thinking around an evaluation or gathering um, information on cost is very important as well. Um, just one nice example here. I'm not going to go into it because we're a little bit time constrained um, of, of some of the, the metrics that we're seeing put forth from Pakistan, for example. And then finally, just to say, um, finally, just to say in terms of our review, what we saw was that um, often there were a lot of good thoughts put forward in these plans, but they weren't necessarily thinking through the whole smart paradigm as, as Jan was saying. So really thinking through um, beyond just training and thinking through uh, what came through in your root cause analysis becomes incredibly important um, as part of your, your uh, improvement plan. So Reda is making me aware that we are a bit uh, running late and we have 75 questions uh, waiting. So we're going to uh, round it up actually with, with this uh, slide on the data improvement plan. So, but first of all, to get, last of all, I would say to get your impact. So how can we improve uh, the process? What can we do to actually make the data improvement planning process better? Is it through a systematic review of the of data improvement plans? Um, should we improve the methodology? Uh, more capacity building like in the IMA course, should we collect and share best practices? Um, should we have a database of recommendations at work? Or should we think about having peer review mechanisms where, for example, uh, at regional level, uh, countries can look at each other's uh, plan and, and give inputs and, uh, and make sure they get improved. So all of these are some ideas we are having. So we see that uh, you, uh, like the idea about capacity building. So that's good because we have a course that is actually starting right now uh, for the first two, uh, four, four, 200 people in, 400 people in French and 400 people in English. And we'll probably repeat that. Uh, systematic review of the IPs, that is going to happen as well. Um, CDC is taking the lead on that. Uh, share best practices, uh, something we'll have to think about how we are going to do that. Maybe through the IMA, it will be uh, also interesting to do that. Um, uh, less people think that we need to really improve the methodology at this point. Maybe after we find the best practices, we can feed that back to the uh, DIP methodology. The database of recommendations at work, uh, let's see if that's an interesting idea. And, and not too many people think that peer review mechanisms are the, the way to go here. I'm sorry for the people who didn't get to vote. It's just like uh, we need to kind of move on with this. Um, so that was it for DIP. So just before I hand it over to Reda, maybe. Can we just ask you uh, very quickly, how did we do? Uh, so was the content relevant for your work? Did the webinar help you uh, with your understanding of uh, the DIPs? Um, will it enable you to do something different in your job when you go back? So these are the, the questions that we most uh, care about. And I think as we have this um, go through, I'll ask Rita to kind of uh, maybe yes. mention a bit of the questions. All right, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Jan and Laura. Um, a very lively discussion going on in the chat uh, also. And uh, as I said, yeah, we, we've managed to answer 40 questions while you were speaking, uh, many of them. So just to reassure everyone, yes, Jan and Laura will be sharing the resources. You will get the recording of the video. I think, yes, and I understand that many of you uh, need that uh, because of the connection problems you've been experiencing. Um, so definitely we will be sharing that um, 
Now, uh, just a comment from Guy Arsène Obrou. This webinar is definitely valuable. I do appreciate it. Web-based trainings on these contents are bigly needed to foster all we've learned with you guys today. Uh, video lectures, quizzes, real-world exercises, projects, uh, just like in free online courses such as Coursera. All right, thank you, uh, Guy, for this, uh, uh, for this comment. Now, I've asked um, attendees to vote on the questions. So again, you know, it's not as fancy uh, or, or visual as Mentimeter, but uh, go to the Q&A panel and you should see a little thumbs up. And right now, uh, there's a one question that has 18 votes. Uh, the question is from ILTU Adeb. Which one is more useful, DQA versus data audit for EPI program data quality improvements? And uh, Ismail Farouk, one, uh, another attendee, has said that, according to him, data audit is better. So Laura and Jan, what do you say? Uh, yes, just to maybe a little bit of a history. So data audit, the DQA, as we had it in 2000, that was kind of the first uh, start. Uh, the reason there to do it was really kind of an audit. It was to audit the numbers that countries reported to Gavi to make sure that the performance-based funding model that was in, in use at that time uh, could be uh, accountable. Um, so after that, it became the DQS, the data quality self-assessment, which was a little bit less strict in the methodologies but still the methods are still uh, mostly there. Uh, what we try to do now is kind of build from that DQA, DQS core. We want to build on that and say, well, there's actually a few things that, are, that we're missing there. And the first thing is on the, at the start. So we said we, we do a field review, but we actually don't critically look at the systems or look at the data. So we try to add that. And at the end, in terms of like the DQAs and DQSs were happening, but the recommendations were not that strong. So we were, we were trying to improve that as well. So it's not an either or. I think the DQA, DQS, DQS or DQSA or whatever people refer to that uh, is still part of it and can be done as part of the field review, for example. This is just a number of, uh, uh, this is guidance to actually improve that process uh, beyond that. Uh, Laura, Laura, I don't know if you want to add to that. One, one thing that I would say is, um, I, th I think from our experience with, with countries and feedback that we've received as well, it's, it's been much more on whether you do a DQA or DQSA or a DQR, it's actually the next step and it's the taking forward the findings and the recommendations coming through those that are, are much more challenging. Whichever methodology you use, you usually get quite rich insights in some of your challenges, but where we heard more frustration was actually much more but then nothing happens. And then four years later, we do another DQA, it finds the same things and nothing happens. Um, so it's really trying to engage with, with country colleagues to, to uh, work with them to see how we can make sure that that doesn't keep happening, that we don't just keep on doing assessment after assessment, but that we actually engage and, and think through the actions and taking those forward um, through these plans. Okay, th okay, thank you. Let's, uh, let's keep answers short and to the point to the extent that it's possible to see how many more uh, we can get in there. Uh, so a question with 19 votes from Dr. Rizwan Asgar, who asks, what strategy um, can we adopt so that all countries ought to use tools for data quality? Since many tools are available, but their use is suboptimal and lack of either interest from partner, staff, or incompetency. And uh, one, one, another attendee, Nargis Maksudova, has, has answered by saying um, she's not competent to answer. So let's hear from you, Jan and Laura. I'm not sure if I'm competent uh, to answer either, to be honest. Um, so the standardization of tools and, and the lack of competency. So I, I think what we're trying to do through this IMA, for example, is first of all already um, try to get some um, try to get some better uh, technical capacities out there uh, in countries with partners in through WHO in the Ministry of Health. So that's the first thing. The second thing is kind of uh, improving the tools and the methods that people use. Uh, yes, as well. I think. At this point, uh, what I would think that people are actually learning together. I mean, we're learning together with everybody else. I don't know if Laura wants to uh, add to that. No, I, I would just say I, I think um, tools as well. Sometimes what we're hearing now is, is a little bit people thinking that tools will fix uh, a broad array of, of data related challenges. And, and we're actually seeing that's not so much the, t the case. So 
again, it's thinking through the, all the, the aspects, the governance, the people, the tools, the processes, policies, all of that is important in order to improve your, your quality of your data. Um, so I think being very realistic about what we think tools can help with and they are indeed very helpful, but thinking beyond tools as well is important. But a tough question, great question. Great. All right, thank you both. Um, so from Kamran Mehedi, a question with 15 votes. Um, is there any other, are there updated documents other than DQS for ensuring data quality? There have also been several requests for the handbook. People, some attendees have asked, where is it? How do we get a hold of it? So it will be in the Dropbox on that link. Uh, it's a draft and just also to say that we're looking forward to your comments on that draft. So it's not, uh, it's not uh, definitive. So, and through this uh, process of learning together with you, we want to improve the draft also. So then we have, um, yeah, we have 10 people and this was a recurring question, uh, just for a clear, uh, simple definition for data triangulation. So 10 votes for what is data triangulation? That's a great question and maybe not that easy. Um, so data triangulation, there's a very restrictive uh, answer that I can give, but in the most narrow definition is that you look at different sources of data and you use the other sources to validate one of them. For example, if you have your administrative data for coverage, now you can look at your logistics data, your survey data, uh, and even your uh, vaccine preventable disease surveillance data to see if, if you trust your administrative data. In a more holistic definition, it's really kind of uh, using data by looking at more than one uh, data point at the same time. So a little bit of holistic monitoring. So instead of saying, well, I'm going to rely entirely on my coverage numbers, is saying I'm going to rely on my coverage numbers and my logistics numbers and my surveillance data and, and all these things. And based on all that data together, I'm going to have a more informed decision than if I would only look at one of them. Uh, so the term comes from um, navigation uh, and, and land measuring, where to find the point that you're not entirely sure where it is, you can best uh, look at kind of two different, at least, uh, sources. Great. All right, thank you. Um, so let me mark that one as done. Um, so nine votes for a question from uh, Viral Sharma. There's actually two questions. Uh, question one is, what is the best strategy for data collection from private health systems engaged in immunization activities? And second, uh, does migrant refugee population in certain areas create bias in administrative and survey data? How can this be minimized? Yes, so these are two important and, and difficult questions. So the first one on the private sector uh, and, and kind of there's a private sector and there's a gray, so there's a, a gray sector as well, which is not entirely private, but NGOs, for example. Um, a lot of that is through kind of, uh, uh, through kind of legal frameworks and kind of legislation. Uh, sometimes uh, if, if that is not there, at least kind of the fact that the Ministry of Health still provides the vaccine can provide some leverage. And in many cases, actually, it's just a matter of trying and reaching out to that uh, sector and find out if they would be willing to report. Um, it is a growing problem, especially in cities uh, and in kind of middle income countries where larger and larger parts of the immunizations are provided, not through the government and free programs, but through uh, private initiatives. Um, the main country, for example, that has to deal with that is the United States, where almost all is going through the private sector and there's almost no data from that country. So that's interesting also. Um, the other part of, about the migrants, um, so this is often, and, and the refugees, I think I heard that. Uh, so this, this creates kind of a temporary uh, numerator denominator inconsistency. We are aware of that. Uh, in, in, in extreme cases, for example, a country like Lebanon can have like 1.5 million uh, people who are uh, Lebanese, but now maybe up to a million people extra who are uh, refugees from, from Syria, for example. So how do you deal with that? Um, and those are very interesting questions. I don't think I can formulate a quick answer, but here, so it, it will be addressed in one of the following webinars, for example, on target setting. Uh, there's also some description of that in the handbook, but just to say that in those cases, you might want to use kind of a temporary adjustment to your target and your denominator for those populations. Okay, uh, thank you. So the next uh, question, what do you mean when you talk about collect qualitative data? Six votes, this is a question from Iqbaver Isaac Iron. 
Do you want to take that uh, question? Um, so obviously, uh, one of the aspects that we talked about in the field review is, is observation and key informant interviews, focus group discussions with health workers. Those are all forms of the qualitative data that we're talking about. Um, so obviously, there is the looking at the actual numbers, which we do through desk review. We can also do the data verification when we're in the facilities um, or districts themselves. But qualitative much more speaks to uh, gathering information around experiences, speaking to health workers, using, using a structured survey or a questionnaire. Um, and we find those are, are incredibly informative as part of this process as well. All right. Just to answer some of the questions, some of the issues that are coming up in the chat. Uh, yes, there's the French webinar on data improvement plans is actually happening Tuesday, this coming Tuesday. So you, you should have received information by email about it. All right. Um, the next question is <clears throat> from Cameron Mehedi. Uh, how to correlate m and &E and data quality? So I, I'm not sure if I entirely, well, it's a bit of a philosophical question. So uh, m and &E is a process of monitoring and evaluation. So we do that every day when we look at uh, how, the, how the program is performing. For example, if you look at coverage numbers, you're monitoring. If you're evaluating, it's when you kind of see, okay, this should we uh, adjust strategies to what, whatever we see during the data. Now, the, the raw material that goes into the m and &E process, that's, that's your data. So the question is, is those, are those data useful for the decisions that you're going to make? Um, and basically, data quality, what we want to do is get it out of the way, say it's not about data being more precise, uh, more timely necessarily, but are they useful for those decisions you want to take? Laura, do you want to add to that? No, great question. Um, I, I, I think they're, they're um, they're so interrelated. So you need to understand the quality of your data um, when you're monitoring. So you need to um, know your confidence of your data um, for your monitoring purposes and monitoring your program. But then um, vice versa, you can also be evaluating the quality of your data as you go along. And that's something that is, is very much good practice. So uh, just to say, I, I think they're very closely interrelated and um, they're, they're sort of mutually reinforcing um, as it were. Okay, we have so we have four minutes left in this uh, in this session in this webinar. Uh, remember, this is only the first, and we hope that if you've shown great enthusiasm for this first one, that you'll be back in the successive weeks for more um, more of the uh, Immunization Monitoring Academy uh, webinars. Great. Can I just introduce quickly the next uh, webinars? Yes, that would be great. Yes. Okay. So, and and while we were talking, actually, a lot of you have. Uh, expressed interest on which uh, webinars they would already attend. So 225 people have done that. And at least 206 will come to uh, the most uh, successful one. So next week, uh, the 1st of November in English, we're going to talk about where to find uh, data that you can use uh, in the course, but also like uh, what data is available at global level, global level, which can actually be around countries. So that can be around coverage and equity things you report through the joint report form. So this will be a great resource for people who actually do the course and are going to make a data improvement plan because we will show you where to get some of the data on web pages that you don't necessarily even have to get from uh, the country field reviews. Um, the third one would be around data use and capacity building. So one of the uh, things that you all said is really important kind of how to create those, that data use culture. Um, so we will try to be as practical as possible with saying what other approaches than training can work um, the fourth one on targets and denominators. So uh, it's a very difficult one to tackle, but we feel it's so important that we have to do it. So there's a census data. There's also kind of local enumerations. Um, what can we do to improve uh, target setting? And this is very much also linked with equity issues uh, because we want to make sure that everybody's included in the denominator, including of course, uh, migrants, underserved population, etc. The fifth one is it is around DHIS2 quite specifically because so much work is right now going on with uh, switching from parallel system to HMIS and DHIS2 is the biggest uh, HMIS right now. So we developed a routine immunization module within DHIS2 and that module is now being rolled out in a lot of African countries but will also be available for other countries and we can have a webinar specifically on that. And then the last webinar is maybe something more out there, something more long-term visionary 
which are the electronic immunization registries. Uh, so the nominal registers where we actually say, okay, we, we don't do aggregate reporting anymore. We try to uh, track Laura and her immunizations and make sure she can come back for her HPV vaccine when she's uh, nine. Um, yes, so these are the upcoming webinars. Stay tuned on that. Uh, we will put everything in the same um, Dropbox folder. So the link tiny URL uh, slash IMA hyphen resources and maybe Reda, you can type that into the chat box again. It will all be there. All right. Uh, and also you. to say that if you, again, because we're learning just like you, and if you have suggestions uh, beyond what you said before for the next webinars, we would be happy to learn from those. And so any comments, uh, suggestion for improvement of future webinars, uh, I'll leave this questionnaire open uh, for like the next few hours so that you can actually give your answers to that. Thank you for my part, from our part. Thank you so much, uh, Jan and Laura. So we're now out of time. We'll, we'll keep the session open so you have time to type in suggestions for improvements. And the first person has typed no, has a, no suggestions. Uh, a lot of appreciation and a lot of thank yous, a lot of recognition of uh, the, the quality of your presentation, Jan and uh, Laura. Um, both from uh, people who are currently in the first cohort of the level one IMA course, as well as, and this was very important for us to include everyone who expressed interest in this question of data, data improvement, even if you might be disappointed uh, that you were not, that we were not able to include you in the first cohort. Very happy to see that, uh, that many of you are, are here and are, remain committed to uh, improving data in your uh, in, in your country. So of course, yes, we will be sharing the Dropbox link, adding the resources as, uh, uh, as promised, and the recording will also be available. So it will be shared with everyone who, uh, who attended. For those uh, 400 or so, <clears throat> 470 or so people who had reg registered but did not attend, um, of course, many things can come up, but we are going to reach out to them and to say that basically if they'd like to be invited to the next webinar, they will have to confirm their interest and their commitment to attending uh, when, they, um, when, when we hold such events. So um, let me see, Ready really was a nice session. Keep up the pace, this was just fantastic, no suggestions. Um, Yes, there, there was one um, concern about recurring concern about the quality of the uh, images and uh, as well as language, but that those were the only <clears throat> two constructive criticisms that I heard during this uh, webinar sound is clear. I love it. For those of you who've had internet issues during the webinar, that's why we make the recording available to everyone. Um, we feel for you and we hope this will improve in the uh, future. And for those asking for the French translation, um, the French version of this webinar will actually happen uh, this coming Tuesday. And we've shared this with the entire Scholar Network with over 3,000 uh, French-speaking uh, WHO scholars, applicants, or alumni uh, of uh, previous Scholar courses. So if you haven't received the information, we'll be posting it uh, in the usual places. Um, all right. So thank you and uh, look forward to seeing you next week for the next webinar. And for those of you who are working, uh, getting ready for week one of the scholar course, going through orientation, uh, even sooner than that. Take care. And uh, back to you, uh, Laura and Jan, to say goodbye. I think you said it, uh, Reda. So thank you very much. It was, it was really interesting to see that so much, there was so much interest and people even stayed until the end, which was indeed longer than foreseen. Yeah, and, and just to say thank you so much on your feedback. Uh, don't be surprised if you see it in some future guidance and future webinars. It's incredibly helpful and we like getting some tough questions. So thank you very much.